Life Changers, Inc. And with me is my wonderful co-host, Sheila Hardy, the founder and CEO of Because It's Personal, Inc. So, Sheila, what are we talking about today? Oh, wow. We have an awesome guest today. He's a must-have if anyone wants to start a small business. He's just awesome. His name is uh, David Pius, and I'm not pronouncing it right, but that's okay. He said it's all right. He's the CEO and president of a private consulting firm called D.B. Pius and Associates, LLC. His consulting firm specializes in small business development and grant writing. David, thank you for being here. Sheila, Erica, thank you for having me. And um, we look forward to a uh, a lively and informative discussion. Yeah. Okay. Well, first, first, before we go any further, say your last name. <laughs> say your name. My say last your name. name <laughs> is Pius. Okay. Everybody heard it here. It's Pius. Okay. P y o a s. Right. P y o a s. Okay. That's yeah. right. Okay. Actually, there's a story behind that that I'll share with you a little bit later. No, tell us now. Tell us now. Tell you now? Yeah. Well, I'm actually, friend. the correct spelling of my wife's name is Poyas. P o y a s. My great 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 grandfather' name was Peter Poyas. Uh, Peter Poyas was a part of a uh, slave revolt, actually, that took place in Charleston in the year of 1822. Peter uh, was uh, considered a master tactician, an organizer, and he handpicked by the leader of the uh, of the revolt, a man by the name of Dan Marvizi. And um, Peter actually came up with the idea of establishing uh, what we now know, you know, in, in some parlance, uh, to be cells, where uh, certain people would only know certain parts of the plan. And that way, uh, in case uh, something happened, in which it eventually did, um, no one could divulge the entire scope of, of what was being planned. Uh, unfortunately, Denmark and, and the other organizers of the revolt, one of the um, members of, of our community decided to tell uh, his owner uh, what was going on. And uh, Peter was eventually uh, hanged by the neck. However, it is written and it is done. Uh, one of the last things that Peter said prior to um, prior to being executed, was to die as you see me do, die as a man. And wow. uh, those were his last words. Wow. That's some big shoes to fill. Good Lord. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's interesting because I can remember, uh, I grew up in Charleston, by the way. Okay. And I could remember... Um, when I was a, a, a real small boy, my great grandmother, uh, who was blind, we would in the evenings, um, under the cool breeze, we, we didn't, we lived near the, uh, near the coast and, um, she would, uh, we would sit in the swing on the front porch and, uh, she would tell me stories about, um, my ancestry and, an understanding of my history, my origin, the things that she endured uh, as a woman, as a black woman, and um, it has uh, served to with a uh, a better sense of who I, as to who I am, a better appreciation for uh, my purpose in life, and um, for that I will be uh, eternally grateful. Wow, that's that's awesome. Well, okay, I'm still in awe. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am. I'm still in awe. There's a lot of stories out there that haven't been told, and um, these are one of them. Yeah. Well, actually, um, 
the story of Denmark Vesey and and uh, my 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 ancestor uh, actually can be found in uh, a well known book. It's called a book entitled uh, "Before the Mayflower," written by Ron Bennett, and um, his exploits are are, are chronicled. Uh, there's another book uh, by a, a Robert Starvin uh, that also chronicles uh, the exploits of Denmark Vesey and my ancestor, so Peter Poyas. So it's 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 in writing. It's it's part of uh, it's a part of American history. So in which generation did P did it become pious? Uh, that happened uh, during my lifetime. Um, there was uh, uh, a, if you will, um, at the hospital, and um, it, it, it was never changed. It, it, it was part of my official document. So that's, that's um, how that happened. Oh, wow. And you never wanted to change it back? I, you know, I, I thought about it. Um, and, and maybe it is something that um, I will do at, at, at some point. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Uh, back on track. <laughs> you know, we'll go down that history rabbit hole forever. Well, first of all, I want to ask you, tell us uh, how you got into this type of business. Well, uh, it my professional career I, I'm, I'm technically trained. I, I started out my professional career actually as an oceanographer. And I had the uh, unique opportunity of working in an area here in, in the Northeast, uh, uh, area uh, in Massachusetts, Cape Cod, uh, Whitsall, Massachusetts. Wow. And if anyone knows anything about Whitsall, uh, they realized that uh, Woods Hole is considered to be the mecca, if you will, when it comes to oceanographic research. Uh, there were a number of organizations, three primary uh, organizations in Woods Hole. Uh, there was HUI, or the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Uh, there's MBL, the Marine Biological Laboratory. And there is the National Marine Fishery Service, which is part of uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I worked with the uh, with NOAA, and um, it was it was truly great. Um, it was one of the first times that I had the opportunity to actually out on research vessels, um, and. Um, uh, that in itself was uh, an experience when you when you're out to sea for uh, weeks at a time and um, there's nothing around you there's there's no land in sight. Uh, I've been in situations particularly doing and I must say during my my first experience actually happened uh, in January oh, and uh, <laughs> I had just moved really uh, to Massachusetts from South Carolina and uh, not had not really acclimated to uh, that kind of cold weather. Mm. Uh, I can remember being on board a uh, ship and, you know, the gunnels of the ship, you know, frozen. Uh, the guidelines, the uh, wires are all frozen. Um the the ship was rocking every which way and you know they're twenty foot seas and but we're there to do work. We're there to to do research. And um <laughs> you just gotta suck it up up and, and, and do what you uh what to do. And and so that was um uh I I, I left a, a great part of me <laughs> in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to hold it in <laughs> uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, but it, it was a it was a fantastic opportunity. Um, it it has served me well over the years. Now my area of specialization uh, was age and growth analysis. Uh, 
Uh, and what, basically what we were able to do, uh, we were able to, I was tasked to collect hard tissue parts from fish. And that include, included, um, but it also include, included a, uh, there's a hard tissue part in the head of a fish called an otolith. And the way that you determine the age of a fish is uh, with scales, for example, looking at the scale under the microscope and counting the, the, the rings, just like you, if you did a cross section of a tree trunk and you see the rings on the tree and that will determine how old that tree is. Well, the same principle yeah. applies with fish and also with that, um, that hard tissue part, that odolith, um, inside the head of the fish. And so that's something that, um, I did. I enjoyed doing. It was challenging. Um, I also worked with shellfish. I had the opportunity to actually publish, uh, an international publication um wallace and uh that paper was well received in the scientific community um so much so that it was presented in copenhagen uh at the international council for the exploration of the sea and what was is, the name of that paper uh ocean cohawks okay okay you broke up when you were saying that okay mm-hmm were were you in school or you had or you had graduated when you were doing this? That year, um, I was still as I was still an undergrad, and I, after I completed a semester uh, at Woods Hole, I went back uh, to school, and then I I went back to um, Woods Hole, and was employed as a as a federal employee. Oh, I was going to say, and now uh, from there, because I'm, I'm trying to link the two from that, you know, playing with fish <laughs> to, you know, business. Where well, where did you even pick this, you know, where did you even get the knack for this? Well, uh, yeah, um, as a as a scientist, as a researcher, uh, you live and die by your abilities to generate funding to do your research, right? Yeah. So grants were very much a part of that process. And so um that was it 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 became very easy for me to um transition or utilize that skill set to what I'm doing now. Um now I I will also I I also had the opportunity to um uh, uh, participate in in various um, seminars uh, while at Woods Hole and uh, discovered that uh, I found people even more fascinating. I found uh, the little bee worked with. Uh, so I went back to school, went to grad school, and had the opportunity to uh, work on Capitol Hill. Uh, I worked as a Senate staffer with the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. Uh, that was a totally different experience. It, it was, in, in some respects, it was even a mind-blowing experience, as being able to uh, walk the halls of, of Congress and uh, rub elbows with the Ted Kennedys and, 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 and folks, uh, Christopher Dodd, and people that I, you would see on TV today, you would see them on CNN, actually, uh, interact with them um, on a regular basis was was um, phenomenal. Wow. So, uh, but how this all ties into to business in uh, 2000, uh, I had uh, just resigned uh, from working with the Salvation Army in New York, where I served as director of operations. And um, having again, once again, with a uh, a nonprofit organization, and understanding uh, how nonprofits assisted with 
addressing various socioeconomic issues uh, that we uh, uh, that we're plagued with, that we're we're, we're challenged with uh, here. At uh, decided to uh, do my own thing. And uh, uh, initially we started uh, as uh, primarily as a grant writer. Uh, and we uh, we found some success once again, primarily with nonprofit organizations. Uh, however, um, uh, with with success, um, as the word got out, because basically we worked word of, uh, word of mouth was our was our primary uh, uh, source of 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 advertising and marketing, if you will. People who uh, had uh, or wanted to do to start a business, and they would ask me, "Well, David, uh, I have this idea for a business, and you know I don't have the funds to do it. Can you?" get me a grant to get me started. We had some success in that arena as well. And however, one of the things that I, uh, I realized and at, at the scientist in me wanted to be able to track uh, the success of those organizations that, uh, that we helped. Right. And what we realized was that, um, in some cases, in some instances, even those persons who uh, had been capitalized adequately, their businesses failed. And I need to understand why that happened. Once again, that's the scientist in me wanting to know why, wanting to understand. We recognized was that, um, for example, Someone wanting to uh, open up a restaurant, you know, who had previous experiences as a cook. Uh, well, just because you're a good cook doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you're a successful restaurateur. Yeah. Right. So um, we 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 sort of pivoted in order to our our clients. Uh, we wanted to help them to truly understand what was necessary. Transition from being an employee to being an employer. And uh, we developed actually a, a training module, if you will. Uh, a major part of that module was an assessment tool that we use to help someone understand, okay, uh, you're a cook today, you want to be a restaurateur, do you have the right stuff? And there were a series of questions uh, that, that, uh, that they would answer, uh, and then we would evaluate that after they had completed that assessment tool to help them understand, okay, things that are required in order to succeed, hopefully succeed in your business. Uh, these are the gaps that we have identified. So here are some of the things you, you're going to need to address whatever deficiencies you currently have in order to succeed in your business. Yeah, that could range from uh, understanding uh, HR issues, understanding accounting, um, you know, a whole suite of different things that go into actually running a business and sustaining that business over time. So currently, uh, D.B. Pison Associates, LLC, we have two divisions. We have a business development, business management division, and we have a fund development grant writing division. Okay, and so on grants, tell us what is the largest grant you have been awarded, or well, you know that you've written that has been awarded. Uh, nine million dollars. Okay, okay, awesome. And then that was a one year, or like over three or four years. Over over four years. Okay. Um, over four years. 
Wow. Now, okay, this is the issue Sheila and I have come across, and it is grants for new nonprofits. So you're familiar with the ARPA, right? The American Recovery. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, mm-hmm. we just, uh, I'm in Cobb County, Georgia, and I just, uh, we just mm-hmm. had a webinar about it, and I asked, uh, you know, you could type in questions. So I asked, can this be, can a, a brand new nonprofit do this, you know, apply? And um, do we have, you know, and I asked three different questions to make sure I got the right answer. Um, were 990s, which are the tax um, forms that are required that a nonprofit has to file, um, th- were those mm-hmm. required? And um, how long did the nonprofit have to be in business? So I was coming at it from, th- you know, three different directions. And they said, no, they in- they encourage brand new nonprofits. So now you were talking about getting funding for someone who didn't have the funding to get started. So I'm going to ask you about that in a second, or I want you to touch on that in a second, please. But with a brand new nonprofit, what tips and tricks do you have to get them funded? A startup business or a startup organization um, actually will, will, tends to be met with, with challenges. Uh, for example, organizations in general, and I'm, I'm speaking in general terms now, right. uh, tend to be less inclined to fund an organization with no history of having receiving or having received uh, grants in the past. Uh, oftentimes, um, and particularly in today's climate, uh, oftentimes organizations are asked with other organizations that may be more established uh, to gain better footing, um, to gain a, a, if you will, a, a greater sense of credibility. Um, and then second, uh, most grant makers because monies have been a little bit tighter recently, have been in, in, in some years, um, it, it just makes more sense to them uh, because it tends to provide a greater return on the investment. That'd be one. That'd be one strategy. The other. The other strategy is, uh, and 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 probably what what's probably important is to have um, your collective acts together. And and what I mean by that is um, having a, a, a good board, board of directors, um, having set up your your accounting system, um, uh, having uh, even something innocuous is just having a, a dedicated bank account for your organization. Um, nowadays also, uh, having a, a website, uh, having a social media presence. But here's key, and if no one gets anything else from me other than what I'm about to say, and, that, and this is it. This is... Uh, this is a David axiom, okay? <laughs> Needs don't get funded. Programs do. Right. I have a, a, there may be a group to do something, but if you don't have a program in place, if you don't have a, a program address a specific need that's truly needed in our society, um, you probably won't find much success. And within that program, as a grant maker, what I'm looking for is how are you going to measure the efficacy of your program? How do you know that your program is what metrics are you using? to evaluate how how well you're doing your job, how well you're spending 
the grant maker's money. So that's paramount. Secondly, I would say that uh, having a well-thought-out uh, strategic plan, having a well-thought-out uh, fund development that provides you with multiple income streams, and um, and what I mean by that, there are different types and different pools of money that you could avail yourself upon. Uh, they range from uh, government grants. They range from corporate support. They range from foundation support and also from individuals. So having a, a plan of action that will to tap into all of these different pools of money to not just fund you for today, but to sustain your organization over a period of time. And then within that fund development plan, well, uh, there, there probably needs to be a mechanism, a, a, a program that, that provides for a, what's known as a capital campaign. A capital campaign that, uh, it's ongoing. Uh, you set a goal and you, you, you establish different modes of, of attack, if you will, or action plan to achieve that particular end. You see it particularly, uh, with some of the larger nonprofit organizations like um, uh, like the Red Cross or the United Way, right? All of these larger nonprofit organizations have an ongoing capital campaign. So um, those are the things. So, and there are others that that uh, that come into play. Um, a few years back, uh, crowdsource funding. Um, became involved. Crowdsource funding is a, a platform like a GoFundMe, uh, for example. That's one of the more common ones. And there, there are several others uh, that will allow uh, people from around the world to fund um, your your program. So uh, there, there are a number of different things that, that uh, profit for example, can do that will assist them with uh, sustaining their organization over the over a period of years. Okay, what would you say is the top priority that a new nonprofit needs to focus on? Uh, is it getting the accounting? Because you named a few things, and I'm trying to keep mental note. Is it getting the accounting system in place? Getting the programs up in, or at least on paper? What what would you say is the first thing they need to concentrate on? Well, obviously, the first step would be to um, do the required filings with the either what, what, whatever state you're uh, being recognized as a nonprofit uh, as a nonprofit organization. Uh, I also encourage my client uh, adopt uh, many the principles that work in the private sector, in the for-profit sector, because, hey, to, you know, the reality is even if you're a non-profit and what that, what that actually means, you still have to operate like a business. Right. Because you are, and all, for all intents, you are a business. Right. So, so having various protocol in place that provides for uh, structure, uh, that provides for accountability, um, are, are, are paramount. So I don't know if I answered your question, but, you know, uh, you know, just having that structure in place, having uh, a, a plan, either a, if you want to call it a business plan, a strategic plan, um, those are the things that will, will serve you well because with a with a with a business plan or a strategic plan, that's like your your roadmap. For example, 
if I tell you, Erica, uh, we're leaving um, from Atlanta and we're going to, okay, and you don't have a GPS, you don't have a, and I'm dating myself, you don't have a, an atlas or a roadmap. <laughs> What's that? How do you get there? Which way do you go? And, and oftentimes, uh, those organizations that, that fail, those organizations that don't do as well as they, they could do, is because they don't have a roadmap. So having that strategic plan in place, I think it's, it's, it's paramount. It's, it's extremely important. Okay. What's the difference between a business plan and a strategic plan? Well, a strategic plan is a, a broader uh, scope of work. Um, a strategic plan would include or could include your business plan. And within that business plan would include your your mission, uh, your vision, your value statements. Uh, it would also include um, your marketing strategy. How do you plan to market your organization? It will also include, and, and very important, your financials, your budget. Okay, and that's something that many, many organizations, particularly in the nonprofit sector, fail to really, truly grasp and appreciate. Because you have to understand not only uh, where the money are coming from, but how those monies will be allocated, how those, those monies will be spent. And to piggyback on your accounting being able to uh, have a, a good, good bookkeeping system in place um, so you don't get in trouble not only with the IRS or the Internal Revenue Service, but also with the persons who are providing you with funding. Right. Okay. How? Okay. And I guess this is this is kind of because I come from the for-profit space, and that went well. <laughs> <laughs> this here was a whole nother story. So my question is, when you're new, how do you know where where those dollars are coming from? How do you know how you know how that will be spent? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, sometimes you don't. You don't know exactly where the dollars are going to come from. I'm with partner. It it would be. Um, prudent uh, to partner with a, a more established profit organization because then that, that kind of takes some of the some of the weight off. But where you don't, that's why it's important to have a fund development plan. Um, uh, and that it may be necessary to hire someone like myself. Now we've been in business for over what twenty two years. I think it's been, and um, we've get, we have a, actually eighty six percent percentage uh, success rate for uh, being awarded grants based on the number of applications um, that we submit, uh, which is far and above industry standard. Yes. So yeah. you may have to hire someone who understands who who understands the process. You know, uh, anyone can submit a grant application. But what I found, Erica and Sheila, is grant writing is an art form. It is. Okay. It it's the different. Uh, I, do you remember the the um, the paint by numbers? Yeah. That, that I was real good at have. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone can paint by the numbers, but there are very few Picassos. There are very few Jonathan Greens. Okay? So that's that's the difference. You can either paint by the numbers, or you can hire someone like a Picasso or Jonathan Green and get yourself a masterpiece. Okay, and what what you know, what is Picasso in the grant? <laughs> in the grant writing space, what is 
what is that? What, what, I, what I mean by that is someone who is good at what they do. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, like, and I know, and I know this. Okay, let's just talk about DMB, DB, Pius. Uh, what do you charge? I come to you. I'm brand new. I don't even have my 501c3 yet. First of all, can I even get a grant? What a 501c3 does, provide grant maker or the person providing you with funding the opportunity to write something off right. on their business, on their taxes, because what, what, what that means is that you are a tax exempt charitable organization. Right. Okay. And so. It, it, it looks good on their, their books at the end of the year that they've done this. Um, it also, uh, part of their, their own, um, uh, marketing strategy, uh, a, a part of their own, uh, so, if you will, uh, that they have, they're giving back to the community. Right. They're, they're doing, they're providing for, uh, a common good. Uh, and, and it's not just about profit maximization, but it, it, it gives an organization of humanity. Okay. So once again, having, uh, your in place provides you with greater entree, if you will, to receive funding from an organization. If a funder, um, had the opportunity to fund a project with someone who was, in fact, someone who is, in fact, a tax-exempt organization vis-a-vis someone who is not, then the person who is tax-exempt obviously has the greater chance of being awarded. Uh, now, there are opportunities for for-profit organizations to receive grants, okay? Um, I do it all the time. Even my company, I've been awarded grants. I'm, I'm totally for-profit, but right. I've been awarded grants. So, okay. Okay? So you can get a grant if you are a for-profit organization, But it it tends to be narrow in scope. It's usually not about um, providing for uh, addressing any particular socioeconomic situation that may be currently ongoing within society. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, that that definitely answered the question. Um, (laughs) What does... Just a broad scope. I come to you and I say, hey, David, I'd like you to write me a grant. That would be one of the blanket grants where all I have to do is change the executive summary, you know, based on my prison reentry program. What does that run? Well, you know, um, I, I would love to give you a, a clear cut answer, but each situation is addressed based on exactly what that person is attempting to do if he has if he or she has a dollar amount in mind have we already identified a particular funder if you no know, if the proposal if you will only requires minor edit whatever that you know however you want to define a minor edit um, but we look at each case on a case by case basis and the determination uh, based on based on that. So you don't have okay, I'm sorry, I lied. I'm sorry, Sheila. Wait a minute. Because I I I spoke with someone and they have it, it I thought it was a pretty cool um almost like a membership grant writing, you know, uh program. So you pay um this amount of money for the whole year and uh you get three or four edits uh, for the year, like if you need the executive summary, you know, but it's based off of your program. So with me being a prison reentry program, she's like, okay, well, 
um, if you need a seven page, because, you know, some are like, uh, we need a seven page grant. We need a 10 page grant. And um, she would, you know, change that. But for the most part, you're using the same grant proposal. Uh, you know, you just make those minor edits, like you said. But you're saying yours is is literally grant by grant, app, you know, proposal. I don't do blanket proposals because gotcha. every funder requires uh, different things. And I personal feeling, I feel as though I would be doing by, you know, you know, I'm not knocking how anybody else does their thing. Um, if that works for them, you know, well, and, uh, but it's just been my experience that whatever we is is tailor made to that specific client, it, and and maybe it's like, for example, um, you know, grabbing a, a suit off the rack and and putting that suit on, as opposed to a bespoke suit that is tailor made specifically for that individual based on his body shape, you know, maybe the one sleeve is longer than the other. So that has to be accommodated. One leg is longer than the other. That needs to be accommodated. Um, you know, so w whatever, however that person's body uh, shape is, then that's how that suit is tailored for that particular individual. And oftentimes you can tell the difference between a bespoke suit or a suit that has been tailored for that individual as opposed to one where this guy just grabs a suit off the rack. Right. And so that's the difference between what we do and what someone else might do. Okay. So with that being said, what's your starting? You're starting. I know it can go up to heaven. What's your starting grant writing proposal? Um, fee. fee. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> fee. Uh, I have to be honest with you. We do have a um, uh, we do have a brochure, but I don't really deal with that that side of of things. Uh -huh. So, uh, what I would encourage someone to do if they're interested in um, soliciting our services would be to touch base with us and we could provide them with a, a list of our services and a, uh, and as well as what the fees would be for whatever it is that they're, that they're wanting to do. Okay. Well, before we uh, wrap it up, we will um, definitely ask. Uh, we'll have you share that information. So, Let's take a break. Let's pause and uh, give a shout out to Ashley of Greater ATL Web Design. The reason why you're hearing this podcast, wherever you're hearing it, is because Ashley does such an awesome job at marketing, and she is definitely worth mentioning. So if you're interested in reaching out to Ashley, you can email her at Greater. ATL web design at gmail.com. If you didn't get that, you can go to our website, the CNN podcast.com and go to the contact us page and you will get Ashley's email there and make sure you mention the CNN podcast to get that discount. All right. And I just want to say that, um, with David, um, it's because it's personal. And that's <laughs> so it's tailor made. I know because <laughs> he works for me <laughs> and works hard for you because I can only and works, imagine <laughs> and, works, and works very hard for me. Yeah. So that's another shout out <laughs> that it's because it's personal. So that's that's pretty cool. All right. Well, well, David, are you ready to play well, it's, the game? It's truly been a late. It's been a late. I'm sorry. Say that again. I said it's true. true. I've enjoyed. I'm, I'm enjoying the experience with you. Oh, <laughs> well, it's, it's it's a journey. It is a journey. Uh, it is an awesome journey. Um, I've learned so much <laughs> in the past four months, four or five, well, six months, 
and it has been a spectacular journey. I've seen some if some of you that are listening to us, if you're not um spiritual or whatever, uh I'm sorry. <laughs> but it has been an an awesome experience spiritually. Uh, call us, me. call us, call us. We're here to, <laughs> to deliver so, you right up to Jesus. Yeah, it's it's that's really been awesome. So, you know, and it's still and we're still experiencing him. So, you know, that's how that goes. But um, I wanted to uh, ask you some questions and it's it's our segment of what would you do? So so. Um, the first question, David, here's the rules. You have to answer the question. You can't say pass. You can't say, um, I take the fifth. <laughs> well, None Sheila, you have to, you have on Capitol Hill. I'm, <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to call him Mr. Vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, so, <laughs> what things that I learned, um, one of my favorite, uh, responses to to uh questions was was this uh i would respond that i would have to give a positive response however i reserve the right of a negative reaction should continuities arise of which i've not been apprised oh my gosh <laughs> i'm dropping i'm dropping the mic <laughs> oh, we gotta get a mic. We and, gotta and my, get a mic. During my drop. short stint at uh, John Jay College for Criminal Justice, I know exactly what you just said. <laughs> my name is Bennett, and I ain't in it. <laughs> what they okay. Well, here's num Here's the first question. Okay. What advice would you give to today's teenagers? Focus. Very good. Focus. Um, have vision. Um, you know what? What's interesting is that I've I've been uh, in, uh mentoring young people. Um, okay. And one of the things that became very clear is that, particularly with with young black men, is that they their their vision had become so obscured. Uh, many of them, uh, a great number of them, didn't feel or believe that they would live past 24. Yeah. And, and that, that's, that was scary. You know, that, that is very scary that you so little f belief and faith that you don't, you don't see yourself living I'm talking 17, 18 year olds living beyond the age of 24. Mm. You know? Can you, so, can you see, can you see why? Uh, yeah, I certainly get it. Certainly get it. You know, I, I was very much hands on. You know, my, uh, for example, my mentee, uh, just, uh, going into his neighborhood, picking him up to, We'd go out to to lunch or 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 go out and and hit some golf ball or, and just talk about life, but the environment in in which he had to deal with on a day to day basis um people don't understand that, and I know she well, this is something near and dear to your heart is the the kind of emotional trauma that these young people deal with every day, you know, um, having these, these young folks at 12 and 13 walking around with a gun in their hip. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and feeling like if they don't have a gun, then they can't protect themselves because something's going to happen or this young man living in, house with his mother and, and siblings and, you know, people shooting up the house, uh, just random acts of violence and, and having to deal with that sort of thing. See, to, to, to a lot of us in suburbia, if you will, or, or we live in a, in a, in a, in a, in a different part of town, 
um, that the only time we uh, see or hear about those things are it, it's on the news. Right. But this is something that these peop- these kids live through on a daily basis. So we don't understand. We don't appreciate uh, how that kind of trauma affects them emotionally, how it affects them spiritually, how it affects them physically. And and so um, I do get it. I do get it. Well, we hmm. have one more question, and then we, we're going to have to wrap it up. But this is really great. But here's your question. If you mm-hmm. can change one thing in the world, what would it be? Wow. Only one thing, huh? Uh, yeah, about that. <laughs> if I could change one thing in the world, if if I could change this one thing in, in this world, if I had the power to do so, that uh, we would all have an appreciation and a relationship with the God of your understanding. Wow. I, I was going to say, because I, I truly believe in, in uh, the scripture of Philippians is that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Mm-hmm. But when you say understanding, though, that's saying, okay, well, Allah is my God. So that's who you would want them to have a relationship with? Or did I misunderstand the way you said that? Well, when I say the God of your understanding, for me, uh, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. I consider myself to be a Christian. I've also had the opportunity to live throughout the world. I've, I've visited a lot of places throughout the world. And um, I've, I have good friends, brothers who will, uh, and they're, they're not, they're not bad people. They do good things. They do some very positive things uh, to make a positive change. In so I, what works for me, um, you know, that works for me, but that doesn't negate that someone who calls God by a different name um, should be discarded or discounted. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Just just so, you know, we're all on the same page. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. So now, David... Um, How can people get in touch with you? Sure. Great. Well, uh, you can reach me at my website at www.dbpyoas.com, or you can reach me at 843-905-3. Five five eight. See, okay. you, see, you spelled your name. You did not say it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. It, it'll be in the. It'll be in the show notes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I mean, this was really great. We're going to have you back again, of course. Of you course. Know, because I'm sure that we're going to get people to act, you know, to list some questions that we may not have gotten into and uh sure. you know we got to get you back so well you know i i'd be happy to to come back uh and and discuss with you in in uh more detail if you will uh about the different types of grants um you know uh Great. first of all what is a grant you know a grant is money that you uh free money that you don't have to pay back Mm-hmm. And and the different types of grants, right, and right. you know where do you go to actually find uh, grant monies? Um, uh, provide them with uh, uh, some resource materials, if you will. So Wonderful. yeah, I, I definitely love to uh, to do that. Um, uh, part of my part of my mission part um, is um, 
being able to impart information uh, right. to someone. So, um, yeah, that that's definitely uh, – um, we're here to help. Uh, so that will be we're... actually – that will be actually part two. <laughs> okay. When we do that, we just talk about the grants and, and go from there. That would be great. Well, I, I, you know, and I, I'll just say this, and I'll, and just so, so you under, you have something to think about. I would like to, uh, I would like David to speak about how nonprofits can also bring, uh, can also raise money through forming a for profit under the nonprofit. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, say that again. What? Say that again, please. When you were saying nonprofits, you know, raising money and put that in their strategic plan and business plan in the financials, how nonprofits can also raise money as for profit, you know, with a for profit arm of their nonprofit. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there's an, there's an, uh, uh, it's called earned income. Right. Well, no, we're not okay. going to talk about it now. <laughs> we're not, no. we're okay. going to say that for part two. <laughs> Grant, grants and earned income. That's it. <laughs> part part two. Part two. Yeah, because I'll sit here and talk about that all day long. <laughs> so, uh, Shirley, want to take us out of here? Okay, well, I'm going to take you out of here. Uh, take us all out of here. Uh, you know, it's always always good for our listeners to to know what's going on out there. And, um, you know, Wayne Dyer says, when you change the way you look at things, the way you look at things change. See ya. As always, be awesome and be blessed.